Hi, welcome everyone. I'm so, so glad to see you. And uh, my name is uh, Professor Ana Elena Torres, and I am a professor of comparative literature at University of Chicago. And I would like to also thank um, Esther Peters, um, who is uh, supporting this event through series. Um, I'm very pleased to be welcoming our guest uh, today, uh, Oksana Sherba. Oksana is an independent researcher and Yiddish translator from Kyiv, Ukraine. She's a graduate of the University of Haifa in the Weiss Livnat program in Holocaust studies. Currently, Oksana has translated a number of works of Jewish authors into Ukrainian, among them Mendel Osharovich, Anski, Sholem Alechem, and Isaac Basheva Singer. Oksana has also participated in a number of projects dedicated to Yiddish revival in Ukraine, such as translation and research on Yiddish folk songs collected during the Beragovsky expedition in 1944 and 1945 for the Babi Yar Holocaust Memorial Center. And today, Oksana's talk is titled Jewish Voices in the Midst of War, Ansky Testimony and Folklore as a Response to Antisemitic Legends in Poland during World War I. Uh, so let's welcome uh, our guest, Oksana, who's speaking to us today uh, directly from Lviv, Ukraine. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you a lot. So uh, I want to start my um, lecture, if I can name it like this, uh, with uh, stories uh, which <clears throat> I found uh, in the first volume of Destruction of the Jews of Poland, Galicia and Bukovina from the, di from the diaries of uh, 1914 and 1917. Uh, this will be a great example of what I'm going to speak during my lecture. And uh, uh, just to give a few words uh, as a foreword, uh, uh, I should say that, uh, like, I think that everybody here knows who is uh, Shlomo uh, Ansky. Or uh, should I uh, introduce uh, this person a little bit? Okay, so uh, just to clarify, uh, it's, I'm not a researcher on Ansky. I was just a translator of uh, the first part of his uh, uh, work, uh, Destruction of the Jews of Poland, Galicia, and Bukovina, which is named in Yiddish, Ter Yiddish um, And uh, after that, uh, I was working on my source paper on uh, the part that I have translated. And uh, <clears throat> so I won't uh, speak a lot about Anske himself because I think that most of you know about him even more than I do. So uh, I will be humble in this respect. Uh, let's start uh, speaking about the core issue of his book. So Shlomansky, as you already know, was an outstanding ethnographer uh, from Russia and uh, born in Belarus. And uh, he uh, uh, held uh, <clears throat> multiple expeditions uh, in Volhynia and Podolia, where he was discovering uh, uh, folklore of local uh, Jewish communities, uh, which were under threat of modernization, and that's why it was a uh, core issue for him to uh, collect as much of the evidence of uh, their modern life as possible. And uh, but uh, on the 19, uh, he was uh, uh, involved in the mission of the Pavlovsky Aid Committees for the victims of the war. And uh, so he was trying to collect uh, funding for the uh, devastated Jewish communities. And uh, uh, while uh, working with the aid committees, he was also reporting on uh, the um, calamities uh, and the war crimes that were happening with the Jews. And uh, he, he was uh, witnessing uh, all signs of uh, genocide, which surely, uh, is not as uh, uh, out, outright as the genocide of the Holocaust time, but still um, it, it should be 
more uh, elucidated these days because uh, the tragedy of the World War I that was publicly omitted in Ukraine, for instance, because we know in Ukraine that what is Holocaust, but we don't know about other uh, examples of um, kill mass killings and uh, ethnic cleansings that were happening with Jewish communities on the territory of Ukraine. And uh, uh, so I will start from the beginning. And at the beginning, Anski was reporting on the uh, massive production of anti-Semitic legends and myths uh, that were circulating among uh, Russian troops and also about uh, among the Polish population. So he does not uh, mention Ukrainians separately in his works, but, but he was uh, emphasizing the role of Poles uh, and the Russian troops in uh, destroying the Jewish communities. So he is uh, telling, he, he gives uh, very telling examples of such like uh, mass hatred, which is a folklore in itself. So basically what can be called uh, uh, folklore also uh, uh, refers to so-called hate speech as it is. So, uh, and uh, in such examples, it is very uh, uh, remarkable that uh, the uh, obvious victim, as it means the Jews, were actually uh, depicted as uh, the uh, omnipotent evil, uh, which can do uh, uh, supernatural things in order to destroy Russian, Russians and Poles and all other Christian nations uh, while uh, uh, cooperating with Germans and Austrians. So mm, there were mm, uh, circulating secret rumors and denunciations uh, in order to emphasize devotion of the Poles. Uh, and uh, ac according to this uh, rumors, uh, Germans and Austrians were met by Jewish communities with utmost friendship and uh, uh, they were provided with foods and with all news uh, which uh, Jews could gain by some uh, very specific, secret, mystical uh, manipulations with the telephones. Because one of the uh, most remarkable features of this denunciation re refers to the old image of the enemy and the innovative image of the evil machinery and the uh, innovative technique, which is uh, the uh, tool of this old uh, Jewish evil in order to uh, conquer the world and to do uh, the, the most, the utmost uh, terrible things. Uh, so uh, a lot of Jews were, uh, were denounced uh, in, for using telephones in order to report to the Germans uh, how they should bomb the cities, the shtetls, the villages. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there were multiple stories how uh, Jews were using this secret net network of the telephones, uh, how they were uh, also sending the um, luminous uh, signals from the windows, uh, like with a hub of uh, glass, I don't know, we're catching the sun rays, you know, it sounds a little bit uh, sick and weird, but that's what the stories were about. Also about the arsonry, about uh, setting a blaze of uh, houses and trees uh, in purpose to uh, provide a signal for Germans and Austrians uh, in, in such a destructive way. So, and for this reason, uh, the Russian troops, even the higher command of Russian troops uh, was also caught uh, in, the midst, in the midst of this propaganda and uh, for instance, uh, this was one of the official reasons for killing the Jews uh, uh, on several territories. For instance, as Anski mentions, um, there were uh, specific uh, places where the troops were going through 
and uh, the Christians were hanging icons on the doors and putting crosses in the windows. So the troops which uh, see the signs, they will not uh, destroy these buildings. But if there were no signs of Christian uh, allegedly, uh, the building was uh, meant to be Jewish and uh, the, the man that it belongs to the Jews, so it can be looted without any hesitation. Uh, um, also, there were a lot of funny stories about the gold uh, that was sent to Germans and Austrians, uh, especially the stories were uh, spread uh, at the borders of the land. For instance, uh, there was a story about uh, a million golden rubles placed instead of a dead man into the coffin, which the Jews tried to bring to the Germans somehow. In other version, uh, instead of the coffin, there were stuffed birds, like dead geese, which were stuffed with gold bars. And, and the, also, as the local population was even calling uh, German Zeppelins Dreyfuses and libeled Jews with the name Vilyusha, uh, which is a diminutive uh, from Kaiser Wilhelm. Also, there was even a, uh, a legend about uh, the Jews who saved the Kaiser from Russian uh, captivity. And uh, also, uh, some spy legends about the maps of Kronstadt the city of Kunstadt, which the Jews had put inside of the bottles and thrown into the sea. So they would sell, uh, sail up to the port of Danzig. It was long before the uprising in Kronstadt. It was uh, like the beginning of 1914, and as you know, the uprising was in 1920, as far as I remember. Uh, so, uh, and uh, mm, the, the, the Ansky uh, shows the polyphony of different voices in his work. So he speaks not only about the uh, local peasants or uh, soldiers who stem from uh, uh, poorly educated surrounding. He speaks also about uh, uh, Russian uh, liberals uh, who, who were thought to be uh, rational thinking people, but actually they were transmitting the same legends uh, very often. So, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Ansky mentions about two very, um, very remarkable situations, and both occurred with him when he was visiting Warsaw. In one situation, he um, uh, <laughs> He spoke with the chambermaid of the hotel where he was staying, and this uh, uh, innocent Polish woman uh, told him that, oh my God, sir, you know, um, uh, the Germans uh, and the Jews do so much evil uh, upon us. And uh, because she didn't know that he is Jewish, so she was uh, um, uh, complain that Germans and Jews are the same evil. And when he asked her uh, what kind of evil do Jews perform on Poles, she told him that uh, 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 Germans are conquering, conquering Poland with say diabolic machinery. I think she meant planes uh, who was uh, bombarding the cities. And at the same time, uh, time when he asked about uh, what harm did Jews do to you, uh, she said the telephones. On Sunday, when the Germans flying machines approached our city, the Jews were sending all kinds of signals that in the church uh, are situated the highest command of military ranks. So Germans started throwing bombs onto the church. And uh, eventually the Germans failed, but there were 10 wounded people and all of these wounded people were Poles. And it was very important for that woman. Uh, and when Ansky asked how come, how could it happen? She told that Jews have such an ointment which they wrap unto themselves so no bombs can harm them at all. And uh, at this point, I would like to uh, remind about the classical work of Joshua Trachtenberg, Devil and the Jews, uh, which uh, is uh, his well-known investigation on anti-Semitism during the Middle Ages. And as he wrote, uh, there were 
uh, several symbols of Jewish evilness, uh, which were circulating uh, among uh, the population uh, in Europe as uh, Middle Ages, and one of them was uh, Magus and uh, the heretic. And uh, it's very important then that even when, even if the church didn't uh, condemn for this uh, particular things, particular persons, in the collective imaginary uh, of uh, simple people, uh, the Jewish nation as a whole was uh, an example of such like heretic and monks. So it meant that everybody is guilty of the same thing, even if they're not condemned. And uh, it is really remarkable that uh, uh, the same uh, feelings uh, of demonization of the Jews were spread not only in Russia or in Poland, they were also spread in other European countries. And if we read uh, the uh, remarkable work of uh, Norman Kohn, uh, Warrant for the Genocide, we can find multiple examples of such uh, mm, uh, legends which were circulating uh, among uh, European society. For instance, uh, uh, if you speak about the telephones, which is a common trope in so many examples, I can mention um, the example from France. Uh, it is, uh, as Norman Cohn mentions, uh, uh, the most uh, vi virulent uh, anti-Semitic uh, writers were among, were among uh, the country clergy because they were descendants of peasants and village artisans. They were poorly educated and their propaganda was aimed at the same surrounding as from which they were stemmed. And so uh, thus he writes that uh, 18, uh, 13, uh, 1893, uh, the great hoaxer uh, Leo Taxil had no difficulty in persuading uh, the people that the head of American Freemasonry had a telephone system invented and meant by devils, and so was kept in constant touch with seven major capitals in the world. And while this particular author didn't uh, mention Jews, while he was mentioning this uh, secret Freemasonry lodges, uh, his uh, colleague, uh, which who, who was Archbishop of Port Louis, and, and he was named, his name was Louis uh, Meran. In his book, Freemasonry, a synagogue of Satan, he does demonize the Jews. And uh, that's what he was writing. Everything Freemasonry is fundamentally Jewish, exclusively Jewish, passionately Jewish, and from the beginning to the end. So as we see, uh, there were examples of uh, anti-Jewish uh, uh, demonization and irrational hysteria uh, on uh, westwards and eastwards. I mean, uh, it was not only uh, the problem of Poland or Russia, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Norman Kohn mentions uh, Russian anti-Semites as um, uh, the particular people who were uh, spreading the propaganda intentionally. Because uh, as he said, uh, in Russian contrast with France and Germany, propaganda about the Jews uh, uh, and their world conspiracy was officially sponsored by the state. And uh, so that's why uh, it's not uh, it's always, it's not uh, something strange that uh, in specifically on Russian territory and, and on occupied Poland we find such like uh, wild statements because uh, at least what I have read about it, uh, Ansky doesn't mention the same uh, situation uh, on the Austrian part. Uh, of Poland. Uh, so what should I say afterwards is that Jews uh, uh, were reacting on the sort of propaganda. They were trying to combat it with their own legends and their own folklore. And uh, among their stories, the very popular, there were popular stories about uh, the uh, justice uh, and uh, revenge that happens with uh, the accusers 
who were falsely accusing Jews in evils they didn't do. And uh, for me, it is really very interesting that uh, uh, the same uh, <clears throat> the same uh, sort of um, justice can be found in old Jewish chronicles uh, from time of Khmelnytsky uprising. For instance, uh, I, we can mention uh, this very important motif, the siege of Tulchin, which was mentioned in such like chronicles as, uh, I, I will just name them quickly, so it will just give you some sort of picture. Yevan uh, Metsula by Nathan Hanover, Tsok uh, Haitim by Ben Samuel from Shabreshchen, Slichot Vekinot of Shabtai Ben Meir Katz, and Petaxis Shuva of Gabriel Schusburg. And in all these old uh, chronicles, that was um, an important notion of uh, collective Kiddush Hashem that was made by the Jews who were dying as martyrs. Because according to the uh, to this uh, historical uh, uh, narration, uh, the Poles uh, were fighting with the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians uh, asked Poles to give up the Jews to to them, and so they can kill them or convert them into Orthodox Christianity. And the Poles betrayed the Jews, and uh, even though the Jews knew about the betrayal, they didn't fight with Poles because they were afraid about their brethren. Uh, that were living under the Catholic uh, authorities. So uh, the, that the kings, uh, knowing about the killing of the Polish nobles, would uh, make revenge on other Jews. So, and that's how they were killed. But at the end uh, of these stories, the Ukrainians, which were called the Greeks or the empty ones, like Klipot, uh, uh, Ukrainians attack the Poles are kill and kill them just because, uh, as it is said, uh, they are like left-handed God. Uh, we did unto you what you did unto the Jews, or because of what you did unto the Jews. And uh, this is like a frame that is uh, mentioned in all these chronicles. And uh, it can be found, like the sound of this uh, um, the echo of this uh, narration can be found in uh, legends that were told to uh, Anski in different vicinities. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, and also the telephones are mentioned there as well, because people were obsessed with technique at that period of time. So, and uh, a huge number of legends recalled the libel on the secret telephones aimed at reporting the enemy at the vicinity of Zamosh. And there were uh, legends about false like Jews saved by the Orthodox priests. So uh, this story was uh, mentioned in many vicinities, like, uh, and it was the same story about eight Jews who were accused by Poles uh, in using these uh, secret telephones, but the Orthodox priests saved the Jews and all the Poles were hanged. So the, uh, the, the basic motif of these legends is that the killing of the accuser. Uh, for instance, there was also a very popular legend about uh, uh, the Countess of Zamosh, who, who was personally uh, using this spying technique in her basement, but who was uh, uh, denigrating the Jews. So um, they were brought to the court and the entire procedure was interrupted by the Russian judge and the Russian teacher. I don't know why the teacher and why the judge and why they are, and why, um, is it uh, mentioned that they are Russians? But anyway, they are saving the Jews. They are going to the basement. They are find, finding the countess, and they are saving uh, uh, the innocents. Also, uh, there was uh, le another legend about the Polish nobleman who kept the poisoned oat from uh, in, in the barn and who accused the Jews for poisoning horses of the Russian troops. And this Polish nobleman was also uh caught uh, by uh, some orthodox people and he was killed for uh, being a traitor uh, but 
uh, a side, uh, as I told, a side of uh, the legends which were occurring amidst the simple people, uh, they were also circulating among the uh, more highly intelligent uh, parts of the society. For instance, uh, I will. Do I have fun? Do I have time? Okay, so there was a story that happened with uh, Judophil, uh, with the last name Petro, and uh, who, he was uh, in his uh, conversation with Anski, he was spreading some overused cliches about the mystical rabbi who rules over all other rabbis and in the invisible hierarchy in which only Jews are confident. And uh, he was mentioning uh, this uh, mysterious rabbi that he has to make a call to all the Jews so they stop being traitors because uh, he was absolutely sure that all the stories about treachery and uh, Spying, they are not just uh, inventions of some uh, evil mind, but they're absolutely uh, truthful. You, and he was even quoting, uh, quoting a story uh, about the old uh, Jewish man who was bringing his, uh, who was carrying his sack on his shoulder, and uh, inside of the sack there was a young uh, German spy sitting inside. So it is absolutely not logical. So how could the old guy? carry on his shoulder uh, an adult man. But uh, uh, the translator of this, uh, the transmitter of this myth doesn't care about logic. It's just a very char characteristic feature of mythology and itself that we don't think what is logic, what is rational. We just transmit the entire story as it is. And uh, we perceive it as a truth. And uh, regarding such things as uh, perce perceiving of truth and its uh, illogical part, uh, Anski mentions uh, <clears throat> a bunch of legends uh, uh, from uh, his uh, from the Jewish speakers. Uh, who were uh, also transmitting uh, um, like legends about meeting of two Jews uh, on the battlefield when one Jew is going to kill the other one, but uh, uh, one of them is shouting uh, Israel, so everybody knows that this is a Jew, and uh, they are saving each other like brothers and escaping uh, the massacre. Or, um, and there was uh, a bunch of uh, variations of the story. And as Anski mentioned, um, often people, the same people were telling the story differently. And each time they were telling the story as if it was like for the first time, because they didn't remember that Anski already heard the story from them. And they were just transmitting it again and again, but differently. So that was happened with him uh, when Anski was visiting Jewish hospital in Moscow, and uh, he was talking uh, with a soldier who was telling him the story about Shema Israel, that he saw uh, his Jewish brother on the battlefield, and he said mm, Shema Israel, and uh, then he saved his life, and he just took him into captivity instead of killing. But another version of the story was that he killed. Uh, the person he killed this guy and uh, while dying he was reciting by Israel and that's how he knew that he killed his uh, Jewish brother and it was a big tragedy for him so the story is the same but and but uh, what uh, Anski tells us is the sensitivity of the experience which people were feeling while transmitting the story so they were really like feeling this story from the inside uh, like insiders, not the outsiders. And uh, also, this is the reason why several legends were more popular than the others. For instance, one of the most popular legends was about Khmelnytsky uh, and uh, Jewish couples that were going to be married and uh, uh, who were killed by Khmelnytsky personally on the way of their marriage. And uh, their tomb was shown to Ansky in 15 or 16 vicinities. And each uh, 
in each vicinity, people said that this is authentic tomb. Here, here is the place where they died. So um, here I would like to mention uh, the notion, notions of uh, uh, resistance to novelty in history. Uh, this is a term that was uh, <clears throat> that was uh, this term I met in uh, the research of uh, Amelia Glazer, and this means uh, like the resistance to the novelty in history means that uh, according to the uh, pre-modern uh, Jews, uh, there was. Uh, nothing important in the history itself. There were some uh, very symbolic uh, events that happened long time ago, and now they are actualizing themselves in the, in the present time. But basically, these events are the same as they were a long time ago, so there is no necessity to put the, uh, much attention on them. So that's why uh, among uh, Jewish communities, uh, much um, uh, uh, attention was paid to uh, composition of the prayers, like uh, especially of the penitential prayers, like Slichot, uh, rather than writing uh, chronicles uh, and uh, <clears throat> trying to uh, focus on uh, the uh, nowadays, uh, like the, which means uh, the historic sort of consciousness. So uh, the consciousness of uh, promoting Jews, according to Yerushalmi and uh, other scholars, uh, it is a historical conscious. And that's why it is mystical uh, in a way of uh, putting the present tragedies in the frames of the old tragedies. So that's why, um, to, according to my mind, uh, uh, these uh, legends about Khmelnytsky were mentioned so often because uh, they reflected the most uh, terrific time in the Jewish history, in pre modern Jewish history. So that's why they just wanted to transmit, especially this legend. And uh, um, it was very important that this legend uh, was reflecting the traumatizing state of uh, communal consciousness. And uh, also, it is. Uh, I was interested in um, another sort of uh, legends uh, invented by the Jews, and uh, like these legends, actually, they don't sound like legends itself, but uh, uh, it is sort of semi-legendary folklore about the heroism. And as I mentioned uh, beforehand uh, about collective Kiddush Hashem, there were also a lot of stories of heroism on the battlefield when uh, uh, Jews are uh, gathering in Minyans, they are uh, taking their tefillin and they're trying uh, to pray. And even the Russian command uh, says that such prayers will be recognized by God. And uh, uh, among the uh, such heroic stories. There is a story of uh, a Jew uh, from Dubno, and uh, just let me find it. It's really very interesting story about the uh, Birkata Levana. Oh, I found it already. So uh, uh, this is a story that occurred in Radivili during pogrom. And uh, the narrator uh, told that he was stopped on the street by the man uh, and who wanted him to pray in Minyan together. Uh, and there are not, not enough people for gathering Minyan, so he just uh, caught the stranger and uh, brought him into his house because that was a yacht site. There was a commemoration of the uh, deceased. So uh, this uh, man uh, followed uh, the host and uh, prayed with him. And after that, uh, the, man, the man asked him to recite the blessing on the moon in spite of the danger of the pogrom. And when uh, the narrator told him that this is not safe and it's actually dangerous, uh, the other man told him that pogrom will be tomorrow as well, but the moon will probably not. 
So, and it means that the, the observance of his tradition mattered to him more than the defense against the blows, wood blows around him. And um, as we know, uh, the, um, this is also very important. I mean, the symbol of the moon is very important in Jewish tradition because uh, this is, there is a legend about diminishing of the moon. Uh, when uh, one of the luminaries uh, was uh, became small, uh, which uh, after claiming that two luminaries cannot be under one crown, and uh, that uh, in a popular Jewish folklore, uh, the sun uh, often uh, um, symbolizes uh, Gentiles and the moon uh, symbolizes the Jews because uh, the same way as uh, the moon uh, restores itself monthly, so will Israel restore itself in the future when Messiah comes. And uh, uh, the same is the truth about a phrase from this uh, prayer which is which in English can be translated as I pray to you God to make the moon call again as it was before it was diminished. So uh, it is also a plea uh, that Israel would be restored to its former glory. Um, and uh, I will not get into much Kabbalah right now because I think a lot of people around here know about Kabbalah much more than I do. It was just like my small investigation to give more taste. And uh, the last story, uh, an example of Jewish folklore in the midst of World War I, will be like this. Uh, there was a story about the two dead men who were uh, roaming among the living. So uh, one of the soldiers whom Anski met in the Jewish hospital told uh, him the story about a small town in Galicia. Uh, which was destroyed by the pogrom, and there were two Jews uh, uh, in a prayer shows, and uh, they had ragged clothing and uh, ragged shambles, and they looked like uh, living corpses, so nobody wanted to mess with them or, or to disturb them, and that's how they were roaming the street, and they were going to the synagogue while the man was following them from behind and uh, from the distance. And then they entered the ruined synagogue where everything was torn apart and the store school was tattered and Aaron Kodesh was uh, uh, hacked and uh, everything was in, in ruins. And that, there was no Midian inside, but some also weird figures who looked like living dead and one of these figures like the narrator told that there were like four or five people inside uh, except of him and uh, one of these figures started praying for Nibre because it was the eve of Yom Kippur and uh, when Anski asked him um, so did you talk to them he said I couldn't talk to them uh, but I could cry so I cried so, uh, and uh, regarding this, uh, I just want to mention the Talmudic statement that after the destruction of the temple, the gates of prayer were closed, but the gates of tears were still open. So if you cry out to God, your prayer will be heard. And um, the other statement also in Talmud uh, refers to the coming of Mash Mashiach. Uh, and uh, it can be read as uh, it is sufficient for the mourner to endure in his mourning. So uh, uh, there will be an additional award for the Jewish people just uh, for sake of their suffering, not even of their repentance. Uh, so, and uh, uh, in relation to this, I just want to mention the last part of my lecture, which relates to Joshua Trachtenberg, uh, whom I mentioned today already. And uh, he, uh, 
that he uh, uh, was mentioning uh, about uh, <clears throat> dead people, uh, the congregation of the dead people who were gathering in synagogues because of the notion of polypsychism, which is a characteristic feature of Jewish folklore. For instance, that there are different souls inside of man's body, and some of the souls are going back to the creator after people die, like Neshama, but other parts are staying on the earth, like the Nefesh stays on the earth during a year, and Ruach stays for, like uh, till the end of the days. It never uh, leaves the corporeal shell of the people. And that's why it is possible for dead people to uh, <clears throat> come to the, uh, their um, ghostly uh, congregations and to pray for the sake of the living. And uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, um, it was mentioned by Eliezer of Worms about such like uh, uh, death congregation on the eve of uh, massacre in Mainz, as you remember, as it was a great massacre in Mainz performed by crusaders. And it was also one of the uh, ultimate symbols of Jewish suffering in European culture. And uh, so that's why when the person was mentioning uh, the crime with the dead, uh, I think it could also refer to this uh, topos um, in uh, Jewish history and culture because it was well known to all people uh, at the time. So to cut the long story short, um, I will make some conclusions. So, um, first of them was that the folklore can have absolutely different forms and shapes, and sometimes the hate speech can also be a folklore itself, and it, it has to be collected and analyzed by researchers because it is not just a thing to itself. It, it stems from uh, particular roots and it has uh, motives uh, in uh, public uh, opinion uh, and uh, in, in uh, mass media in, uh, everywhere. So it, it can be analyzed as a sort of uh, mm, the root of the propaganda which can make an offshoot out of it. And also, uh, it is really important that uh, Ansky uh, was reporting on different, um, different opinions, uh, and uh, he represented uh, opinions of different strata of people and disregarding of their nationality and their uh, religious uh, allegiance. And um, it is really important that uh, the times which were mm, uh, not that much illuminated in research, uh, in literature, in, for instance, in Ukraine, uh, that they have to come at the forefront uh, because mm, many uh, aspects that were revealed during the Holocaust, for instance, they, uh, have already been there during the previous uh, tragedies, previous calamities. So it's uh, mm, also important to remember the ties between uh, <clears throat> historical events. And especially nowadays when we see that propaganda also spreads through uh, unbelievable uh, folk tales, myths, and uh, uh, crazy stories, it's also interesting to know that it's not like this only right now. And uh, the stories uh, which uh, bring, uh, which are the warrant for genocide, they appear uh, nowadays uh, no less than 100 or 200 years ago. So I think that by now I'm, I'm, I can end my speech. And if some has questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sherba, so, so much. Uh, it was really remarkable um, 
uh, talk, I think you managed to represent the polyphony, as you as you say, the polyphony of the research, um, the way that you open up this genre of of folklore um, and gives us another lens for considering uh, these deep rooted conspiracy theories and and you've managed to to really give us a fascinating framework, um, I think, which connects multiple multiple fields around ethnic studies and ethnography. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I have some questions for discussion. I wanted to say that if you look in the chat, you'll see there are a number of uh, expressions of goodwill and solidarity uh, with you and cool. with Ukrainians as well. Um, we have a question uh, from Lev Dashko. Um, I can uh, I can read it aloud if you'd like, or uh, or Lev if you'd like to. Uh, turn your mic on. You can ask Ms. Sherba. Uh, sure. Uh, I'll just ask since I kind of have a, a follow up as well. Uh, thank you. Like I said in my message, thank you so much for the enlightening talk, especially considering the conditions in Ukraine and in Kiev right now. Um, you mentioned that uh, Ansky recorded most of kind of the anti Semitic. Uh, folklore within Congress Poland or like the, uh, I guess the Russian controlled Polish lands, um, but not as much within the Austrian lands. Um, is, was, did he hear some from Galicia and Bukovina as well? Or was it basically almost all of his writing is just on the, the Northern Polish lands as it were? Uh, I think that for sure he heard the a lot of stories from Bukovina and Galicia who were under uh, the authority of Austro-Hungarian Empire. But uh, the point is that I didn't translate these two parts of his work. So I translated only the first volume and this is my uh, goal to finish my work. And one day the entire uh, <clears throat> Compendium of three volumes will be ready for Ukrainian readers, and then I will answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank uh, you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, people can continue to contribute their questions in the chat. One thing I would be interested to hear a bit about is just the process of translating. Maybe you can say something about the texture or the linguistic qualities of Ansky's writing. And then thinking also that you're translating to Ukrainian and Ansky, of course, was also writing in Russian. So I wonder if there are particular uh, literary qualities that lent themselves to translation into Ukrainian or really any thoughts you have about the process of translating from Yiddish. Uh, well, uh, it was not that uh, hard for me to translate uh, Ansky into Ukrainian, because uh, as I perceive it, uh, the logic uh, of Yiddish uh, structure, uh, grammatic structure, it uh, sometimes uh, um, echoes the logic of Slavic languages. I mean, uh, mm, uh, that uh, is, there are not such strict rules like in German language when you know how to begin the sentence and how it should end, but you cannot uh, play with the words uh, in, inside of the sentence because each word has its proper place. So it's not like this in Yiddish, so that's why, because I learned a bit of German and I know Slavic languages and I started learning Hebrew as well, so it was not a big deal for me to work with this, because uh, thanks God, Lansky uh, is not as uh, harsh for translator as Shlomo Leichem, because Shlomo Leichem, that was a challenge for me, for sure, because I just had to remind myself how my grannies, how my Ukrainian grannies were speaking, because uh, I felt like I need to translate Shalom Aleichem's speech in a way as old people were talking among themselves. And uh, so that's why this old Galician talk was uh, my tool in performing my translation work. But uh, with Ansky, 
Partially, I also did the same because uh, the author is uh, not that modern, so that's why I could uh, imply the same technique to several uh, fragments of his work. But usually, uh, I just uh, did it uh, using my intuition, and uh, I just needed to, I needed my translation to sound very natural. So people want things that, oh, yes, this is translation from Yiddish. It has to sound like it is originally Ukrainian. So that was my aim. Great. Thank you so much. I, I really love what you just said about reminding yourself how your Ukrainian grannies talked and this emphasis on, uh, on listening to the text. This is also kind of a turn in Jewish and Yiddish studies, the work of um, Hana Pauline Galai, for example, mm. she writes about listening to testimony. And so I really appreciated what you said. Uh, we have a question from Raya Shapiro. Hello, first of all, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I also had a question that was a little bit um, a follow up to Anna's, I think, about translation is because um, I know that Anki kept the diaries mostly in Russian, but a little bit of Yiddish, and then he um, translated himself while also adding on to them um, into Yiddish and that was partially um, to make it more complete and also partially because he was writing specifically to a Jewish audience um, and I was wondering how much um, you needed to contest because like there were some references he made that he just knew would be gotten um, immediately by his audience and, and I was wondering um, how much you needed to um, contextualize or kind of like circumlocutor or what kind of footnotes you need to add and in, in order to make it more legible um, for a Ukrainian language audience. Thank you. Um, well, uh, by now, uh, my work is still not published. So that's why I didn't make any, uh, only my source paper is, is, is going to be published in a magazine. Uh, it's called Judaica Ukrainica, and I had uh, uh, good reviewers, so like um, Amelia Glazer was my reviewer, and she uh, got a positive feedback for my work, and uh, so this will be the work of editors, what should they add, uh, uh, because like I would like to add several notions about the Jewish culture, uh, uh, for instance, what I was, uh, quoted uh, uh, about uh, the Birkat Halavana, about uh, the case of tears, like something that is not inside of Vansky himself, but uh, which is interesting in order for people to give to get a taste of Jewish culture more fully, because it's an interesting information, and even if it's not necessarily present in Ansky, but uh, it makes the, uh, his report more uh, fluent, more interesting and more polyphonic. So that's why I would uh, add uh, some information about what is Yom Kippur, what is Polinidrei, uh, what are these things about, uh, just to, in order to make this book not that estranged from Ukrainian uh, reader, because like Ukrainians nowadays are very interested in Jewish culture. That's what I can say. And uh, the point is that uh, we need more specialists in Jewish culture because like I'm a translator, but I had to make a research myself because otherwise I was afraid that my work will be dry and uh, mm, boring. I didn't want it to be boring. I wanted it to be uh, full of uh, insights for the people who are going to open the book. And also, um, I was just feeling that this part of text is a little bit strange because I don't know what it means exactly. So I will search in some Jewish books what it can mean. So that I've, that's how I was doing it. It was like detective work for me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, I think it's impossible that this book would be boring. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted it to make even more uh, actual, like. Um, I think Talia has a uh, has a hand up. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't 
have um, so, so much a question as I just want to say, Lana, uh, we love you and uh, support you and so glad to hear your voice and see your face and um, everything I love that's happening. <laughs> everything that's happening in Ukraine sucks so much and um, and we hope that you can get here and be safe. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate your uh, your attitude, and I'm really happy to see your face finally because I didn't see you for years. So, and I hope that everything will be okay at the end. Somehow. Uh, do you have any questions for us? Or, or even if there are any other any other stories or aspects um, that you might that you might want to share uh, that didn't uh, didn't fit in the talk, I also while you think I wa also want to mention that tomorrow we're very uh, fortunate the Yiddish Landkreis oh. is going to be meeting and uh, Oksana will share some uh, a few pages from Anski so we can read them read some of these outrageous tales uh, all together. Uh, so that will be tomorrow from 12.30 to 1.30, and this will be the Yiddish, uh, the Yiddish Tish will gather, and uh, Oksana will be our guest again tomorrow, uh, looking at some of the Anski in Yiddish. So I think that the stories that I didn't tell yet, I can tell it tomorrow. Actually, it's related with Khmelnytsky uprising and with the legend of uh, Mm, uh, the couple uh, which was killed uh, on the way to the Hupa. And uh, so I will find uh, the pages in Anski's work and we will talk about it tomorrow. Mm. Sure, thank you. Uh, we had another hand for a moment, um, but then it went down. Um, I want to tell you uh, also that we were getting many messages uh, from people appreciating your talk and, and wishing you solidarity and safety. Um, yes, it's very pleasant for me, and it really gives me strength. Thank you. So, is the is the um, is the is the, is the um, how how is the, the the manuscripts? How were they how were they written? Were they in handwriting or in type typewritten? Uh, actually, it was uh, published in Warsaw posthumously after Anski died. It was in 1920, and uh, uh, it was it was printed. It was printed. It was uh, like I think that uh, firstly it was his diaries, and in diary, and surely it was handwritten. But after he moved to Poland, where he died, uh, these handwritings were uh, published in Yiddish. So they were never translated into Russian, as far as I know, because I didn't find any mention of Russian copy of what he did. So no, the is, Yiddish is uh, Yiddish. Good, so, good Yiddish. so his ethno ethnography, I understand, uh, some of it is in Ukraine and some of it was in St. Petersburg. That some yeah. of his writings are are in this in Saint Petersburg. Yes, but I just want to say that I'm not specialist in Anski because surely he did a lot of uh, different work. He was uh, an ethnographer and he published in uh, Saint Petersburg a questionnaire regarding uh, several huge topics. Like uh, one topic was called a man, and it was about uh, the death, birth, marriage and uh, things related to all these customs. And uh, okay. he also wanted to, to publish another questionnaire that relates uh, to the holidays, but it never happened because of the war. And um, uh, the answers uh, which he collected, the answers to these questions were also you know, in Yiddish, and I don't know how to say it in English. So mm -hmm. they Lost. were never, it's never came into being, basically. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, seeing as uh, seeing as it's now about ten p.m., 
uh, in Lviv. <laughs> this might be this might be a good time uh, to say thank you again uh, to Oksana, and I'll stay on uh, for a few minutes. Oksana, we can chat. Um, but uh, thank you, thank you again. And uh, for those who are interested, you can uh, uh, be in touch about the Yiddish Landkreis tomorrow, uh, 1230 to 130 Chicago time. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so a much. lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you again so much.